there's a debate in the Islamic tradition. The the only legally, it's in, in terms of what was according to Sharia, the only source of slavery, it, if, if abducting people and selling them to slavery is clearly haram, and as the Prophet ﷺ said, anyone that buys such a person is cursed. The only source of slavery that was kept was slavery through war, meaning that if there is a war and there are and this was the old system that the entire world worked according to is that th there are prisoners of war the prisoners of war are either ransomed if they're not ransomed then they are sold into slavery this is of course on the principle of reciprocity so if the enemy does this to muslims then muslims can reciprocate now, but there is a debate as to even as to those prisoners of war, where their sexual relations are permissible with these, if you buy a slave who was a prisoner of war, uh, without marital contract or not. And in my opinion, the correct view and the view that is 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 that of course it required a marital contract and the biggest proof of that is that even those who don't support the marital contract uh, uh, perspective if you read this area is gender neutral it means it on its face it's gender neutral if you're going, not going to read a marriage contract into the requirement then that means if you have a female slave you can have sex with them and if you have a male slave, you can have sex with them, whether you're man or woman. Now, those who don't believe in marital contract, once you tell them that, say, no, 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 a women can't have sex with male slaves, and a man can't have sex with a man, even though they're a slave. And then you say, well, where do you get that from? If, if the language is gender neutral. And then they, you know, they do all types of cartwheels to try to justify their positions. The, the truth of the matter is, is that contrary to what some people these days have tried to argue, I don't know what, what their problem is, but this issue has been researched tons of times. I mean, it's been researched since now for over a hundred years. It, you you couldn't just rape your slave you had to have a marriage contract the only issue about a slave is that they were not part of the polygamy rule and if the slave becomes pregnant if it's a woman then the fact that the slave became pregnant then that means that slave has to be freed pregnancy meant the slave earned their freedom because it was inconceivable that that would be the child of your mother and she's still a slave. Um, anyway. Uh, in a related question, Jazakallah, for such an enlightening and spiritually elevating, spiritually elevating halakha, may Allah reward you. My question is just on marriage to a slave. You mentioned that their relationship as a slave ended with pregnancy. Was their relationship of slavery also ended after marriage without having children? Um, it's not only that. I mean, the there's a lot of fuqaha that said that if the slave converts to Islam, then they're no longer can be slave. Um, and a lot of slaves converted to Islam because of exactly that. Although, so later fuqaha, I mean, later juristic schools started saying, well, conversion doesn't automatically free people. Um, you know, so 
sort of imperial law. Um, and of course, if you're married to someone who is supposed to be your slave, what does that mean? You know, it created a lot of problems in, in practice. And so a lot of jurors started saying, well, uh, if you married a slave, then they automatically become free. Um, um, but the best way I can, there is a huge difference between theoretical thinking about it was clear that early Islam didn't like the institution of slavery and tried and there was a very strong ethic of manumission of uh, and so to the to the extent that in Islamic law books there is no chapter in Islamic law books on slavery, there is only a chapter on manumission of slaves. But there was an imperial reality. Shortly after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, Islam became an empire. And empires at that age all had slaves. And, they, and there was an enormous amount of social resistance to what well, I'll say moralists, people who were, so for instance, part of Islamic law is that a slave has the right to do a mukataba. The slave has a right to say, okay, you bought me as a slave, I want to buy my freedom. So you are legally bound to make a contract with your slave saying, if you pay me X amount of money, you earn your freedom as a slave. Now, that was radical. At that day and age, it was radical. You, you know, it, for, it, it was just absolutely revolutionary to actually force the owner of a slave to say, um, your labor is worth money, and and if you you know reach, and then the slave, if the owner had demanded too much money, the slave had the right to go to court and get a judge to set the price according to market value of what's how much money you you needed to pay to earn your freedom. But although that's the law, when it came to real practice, very much like the issue of women divorcing themselves or women inheriting, the, there was a huge disparity between legal theory and legal practice. Because when it came to real life, of course, there was an enormous amount of resistance. What's interesting, though, is that because of um, the the because of the 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 slavery never became like it became in the West, where slaves just became chattel, uh, you know, just property, and you could do with them as you wish. Um, the primary the primary place where you found you found slavery as institution although islamic law managed to among the average human beings most of the the classes it dried up slavery it it continued to survive a was the very rich classes so the elite that often could afford to, um, and the state, which often bought slaves to enlist them in the military. In other words, to turn them into soldiers. Eventually, 
the irony is that th these slaves um, that were constantly bought by the state from uh, from wars, uh, enlisting them in the military, eventually sl these slaves became the rulers in the the Mamluk dynasties in in Syria and Egypt, where you know it's as far as I know the only place in human history where slaves actually became the rulers for many centuries. Um, so I I mean the issue of the issue of slavery in Islam needs good historians and needs people who are um, needs to be studied from uh, people who are not writing to Western audience, you know, not trying to earn points with the West but actually looking at history with all its complexity. And in the 60s, I remember 60s and 70s, there were a few, there were a couple of really good books that were published back then that were heading that direction. And I probably can find their, their and they're actually on the reading list mm. uh, that Osuli has, because I remember I, I, I listed them. Uh, but since then, um, Ever since Bernard Lewis published his work on slavery and Islam, it has been downhill from there. Um, you know, since then, everyone who's written on it, it was either to earn points with the West or to uh, spite the West. Um, but it wasn't good. It's not good historical research. The subject is, it, 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 I mean, till now, Even the, the couple of people who recently published about slavery, they have no explanation for why Islamic law books did not dare have a chapter on slavery, but would call it a chapter on money mission. How could they, you write about a subject like that and not explain this? What, what, type, of, what type of ethical code did the prophet enlist in, in green and Muslims, so that they found, felt compelled to call their chapter, the chapter on many, many missions. What did it mean when the Prophet ﷺ said, it called slaves your bro brothers and sisters, ashaqa'ukum, and required that they be fed from what you're fed and clothes from what you're clothed, and that you couldn't discriminate against them in treatment. What what did that what import did that have? What did it mean when the, in slavery the way you had sexual relations with slaves, and in the institution of slavery is rape. So what did it mean when it came for Islamic law came in and said, well you can't rape a slave. You can't coerce a slave to have sex. So then and the slave could have a cause of action the slave could sue her master in a court saying this master doesn't have sex with me and is not satisfying my sexual desire so judge can you free me so i can go find someone who will have sex with me this is completely alien to the institution of slavery in the west but then you have those people who write about slavery in Islam completely ignore their stuff, completely ignore it. Which absolutely is mind-boggling because, you know, and then they, they get into, you know, anyway. Um, Like this guy, you know, wrote a whole book, completely ignored the fatawa that says, no, you can't force a slave to have sex. Because the Prophet did not do that. I, I don't know. Anyway.